this is what we got, guys. A guy with a broken pelvis and neck and hands. We're gonna go over the top, direct. And then into Juno, we're gonna meet the, uh, uh, the ambulance. So we just got a call regarding a gentleman in Haines, which is north of here, who got into an ATV accident. A lot of times with these remote towns like Haines, uh, the only medical facility that they have there is a clinic. Um, probability of survival is low, is what they said. And we are gonna be taking you to the nurse for the doc from Haines, so we will have uh, higher level care on board. Haines is to the far reach of our northern AOR. Currently, the plan is to get him to Juno, to an ambulance, and get to a hospital right away. He's in critical condition. He does have a broken neck. He does not have movement of his legs. Um, he's got movement of a couple fingers. And he's uh, unconscious on a ventilator and needs to get medevac to ASAP. Order break is coming off. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. Due to the geography of uh, the Haines area, the local medevac companies uh, can't fly at night into those airports. And this guy definitely needed to get to a hospital, get blood, and get uh, the treatment he needed. The Coast Guard is able to play a vital role in situations like this when other companies can't get in to uh, transport patients. Uh, you can tell them that our ETA is 0300 local. Roger. Searchlights off, goggles are on. This launch is at an inopportune time because it's happening during the few hours of darkness. We don't have moon tonight. And that's really our only limiting factor. Winds aren't bad, ceilings are pretty high, good visibility underneath those ceilings. So that does help facilitate a direct flight from Sitka to Haines. It's pretty big peak. Yeah, it's pretty amazing out here. Hey, Jason, just so you know what I want to go with this. If the patient's on a backboard already, I'm not going to transfer them to ours. I'm just going to put their backboard in a litter. Yeah, I'll go out with you, because we're going to have to carry them back in and stuff, too. So yeah. what did you just you just tell me what you need? Roger. Once I'm going to this belt, I'm going to slowly start putting this litter together. No problem. We are 33 minutes out. Roger. On our flight to Haines, we got the litter configured in the back of the plane. After hearing uh, about the patient's condition, I knew that uh, this was a pretty serious case and that this guy was in critical condition. Luckily, it was just nice out, so we could fly right over the tops of the mountains, and it was a pretty quick flight over to Haines. Looks like they're waiting for us there. Yep. Is that the ambulance at 11 o'clock? It is. All right, guys, if anybody's in your spot, they're in them, uh, let me know. I'm kind of diving down, coming over the mountain. Crew four ready for approach. Perfect. Ready for approach. And Sector Juno from Rescue 3 8 be advised we are on approach to Haines at this time. Taxi way in sight. And everything's looking good. About close enough. That looks perfect, sir. Yes, sir. Going up, I see us. So after we landed in Haines, my flight mechanic and I walked over to the ambulance, and I got in the ambulance to get a brief about the patient. The patient was not stable. Spinal injury, internal bleeding. You could tell that all the first responders that had been providing medical care to the patient were pretty beat and pretty tired, and you could tell that they were struggling to, you know, keep this guy going. It was clear that the condition of the patient was dire. In addition to the fractures, blood pressure was dropping, heavily medicated, and we made the decision to take both the doctor and the nurse. So we'd have three qualified medical professionals in the back for this short transit from Haines to Juno. The 
The main concern with transporting him being that he had a broken neck was to not bump him around too much, to make sure we get him onto the stretcher safely without rattling him too much. Knowing what the condition was of this patient, it only increases that sense of urgency to get there as quick as possible. He was really in trouble. We get our patient in the helicopter, get our life pack uh, hooked up to our patient so we can monitor his vital signs. We had the nurse and the doctor on board, and they were able to provide most of the, the care needed. Crew report ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. This guy was out looking to go have some fun with his buddies and went four-wheeling and was a life-changing event. In Alaska, it can be a dangerous environment. And um, unfortunately, in this case, uh, even if our efforts facilitated a recovery from the condition he was in in the helicopter, he's going to have lifelong altering physical needs that he's going to have to live with. That's kind of a tough one to swallow, particularly when, at the end of the day, we're out doing the same stuff that he's out doing and uh, enjoying this area the same way that he is. and just kind of opens your eyes to how uh, unforgiving that can be sometimes. All right, guys, in route to uh, Juno, we'll be keeping it under 1,000 feet. So we'll just plan on 500 the whole way there. Roger that, sir. Once we're on final approach there, we're in the very last stage of this process as far as what our role is knowing that he was in the same condition at that point that we picked him up in uh, made us feel uh, like we, we got our part of that job done. My name is Christian Rasich, and I was injured in a dune buggy accident in Haines, Alaska, which is where I live. I'm from Haines. I just was sitting around a campfire, and uh, this guy pulls up in a dune buggy. We just start talking, and he's like, hey, you want to go for a ride? You know, hop in. Go just up the street. Next thing you know, he says, hold on. Turns left, and uh, we're airborne over the sand. And he's like, jumping this big jump. Thing goes up, turns sideways, <laughs> comes down upside down with me underneath it. And my first thought was that I was paralyzed. I was like, oh, great, this is it. I'm paralyzed. I can't move. I can't talk. This is something really bad. And I'm gonna be paralyzed the rest of my life, or maybe even die. I really thought, maybe I'll just die. Lacerated liver, 12 broken ribs, two deflated lungs, both lungs deflated, three cracked vertebrae in my neck, two broken scapulas, and I knew, I knew from living in Haines that I was remote and that there's a couple doctors available at the clinic, but everything's a plane right away. You know, nothing is close. And that's where the Coast Guard came in. Having the Coast Guard around is like, you know, and being such a presence in our community is like, it's like having a backbone, you know, like you always know that you have the Coast Guard that you can ultimately rely on. Man, I was on death's door. Like, I probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. You know, when no one else would fly, these guys flew in and, and hauled me up and got me quickly to, to help, you know, to medical help. And that's, it's immeasurable. I can't thank you enough. There's one set of tracks that goes off to the left into the woods. But I don't know why the she would do that. It's on the bank. Well, let's find her and ask her. There was a 25-year-old female that was on an ATV, and she was reported missing. Right there at 3 o'clock, there's something. All right, let's follow this, uh, follow this slew back. We want to find this girl quickly. It's dangerous out there. It's cold. She could be wet, stuck in a river somewhere with inadequate clothing. And she's probably scared. Missing ATV. -er. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of information right now, so we want to get out there as fast as we can. 
make sure we can help them out if we can. Um, luckily, there's an ATV involved, so hopefully we can find the ATV and find the person. That's what we're after. So the alarm went off at approximately, actually it was exactly 2.40 in the morning. I'm accustomed to checking my watch to make sure we meet our B0 30 minute response window. We want to find this girl quickly. She's local, we may know her, it's dangerous out there, it's night in Alaska, it's cold. She could be wet, stuck in a river somewhere with inadequate clothing, and she's probably scared. We want to do what we can to get her out of the bad situation and make her day better. Ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. Roger. We did our checklist, talked about the dangers, talked about uh, what we were going to do, and we took off around 3 o'clock towards Sultry Pass. Which is a short flight. It's right down the road, so it was really less than five minutes to get there. Sir, should we bust the parking lot at all, or what's that car down there to our left? I do see a truck next to a wheeler. Yeah, that's somebody out there, for sure. We'll uh, see if we can find a spot to put down and talk to these guys. Immediately when we arrived on scene, the general search location, we could see headlights, um, which are as bright as the surface of the sun in the NVGs. We could see down into the valley that there was a truck parked there. We had our fingers crossed that that was the four-wheeler that was lost. I would come down to 100 feet for a low recon. Sir, he's waving, or he was pointing directly for our 3 o'clock. Door's coming open. Are there trees? I think I see some Sorry, trees in there. pointing directly to his, to the vehicle's right. And he's pointing like he means something. Well, we'll sit down and we'll talk to him. So it was challenging, but we found an open space where we were well clear of the trees. I can't really tell if there's any bumps yet, but no rocks or logs or anything like that. And we slowly lowered the aircraft down to make sure that we weren't on too steep of a slope so that we could be level and the people could exit the aircraft safely. Where's the guy, sir? All right, so 1 o'clock. Roger, Mike, clear to go check out. You What's are. Going on? And, uh, He's driving over here. There's his headlights right there. Roger, I'll be on channel 2, sir. Right there. Roger. Roger. Yeah, going just keep us updated. Guys. Roger. rescue swimmer go make contact with the boyfriends we had a good verbal idea of the situation a description of the female so we knew what we were looking for what the four-wheeler looked like what she was wearing how she was dressed little details but they add up in case somewhere up here six or seven miles they think that she followed the river up or down that's all they knew and this was all yesterday. Well, I guess we got some more information than we had before. It's his girlfriend. Her name is Michaela. They said six or seven miles up, not the first, but probably the third river crossing is the last they saw her. Third river crossing, Roger. I feel like our probability of success just went up a lot. And Will, can you fire up the track beam with a NVG filter? Yes, sir. The setup and the aircraft configuration for a night SAR case in Alaska is critical for us to really be able to find the survivor. In this case, we have the flight mechanic on night vision goggles with us, and he's working at the track of beam, also called the night sun. You know, like in Batman, where that beam goes up in the sky, it's that bright, but down in the ground. So it's an amazing search tool as well when it's, when it's dark in Alaska. Let's pretend it's your first time up Salt Street. It's getting dark and late. You're on your way back. 
and all of a sudden you're by yourself. What do you do? I don't know, try to find the main trail. You think, yeah. But if it's uh, your first time and all of a sudden you're lost and scared, it's dark and there's bears, you don't know where you're going. Uh, What's up? I, sir, I think we got a four-wheeler on the hill back here. Alright, uh, park point down. Directly behind us at our six o'clock. Park point down. Directly behind us at our 6 o'clock. Approximately 2.40 in the morning, the ODO knocked on the door, said that there was a 25-year-old female that was on an ATV, and she was reported missing. All right, we're right there right now. Ah, uh, there's a bear. I'm oh, sorry. I'm looking, oh, I'm looking at a bear right now. A bear. We're trying to figure out where the individual survivor is. As far as the FLIR, or the forward-looking infrared, the rescue swimmers looking for heat signatures. Sultry Cove, and just it being Alaska in general, there's tons of wildlife out there. We're picking up bears constantly. The heat blooms look like people at a distance, but usually you can see their little ears poking out. So it's like, all right, that's not what we're, lo what we're looking for, unless our 25-year-old female has gigantic ears and weighs 1,200 pounds, which generally just isn't the case. At our 6 o'clock, there's something. It was really hot. Yeah, I keep looking for it. I yeah, think that's uh, definitely a bear. bear. Threats to the survivor are generally environmental in Alaska. You've got hazardous animals out there, such as bears. They usually need some reason to be provoked. However, you don't want to surprise a sleeping mammal that is a thousand pounds heavier than you. So we were concerned that we do need to get this survivor out of there. We're thinking she's probably cold, probably wet. It doesn't sound like she's experienced in the area, so she may be wearing cotton, vice wool. It just makes time a critical component about extracting a survivor from that situation. Even though it's warm, you can still get freaking hypothermia out here. Yeah. Or eat by bear. Man, the visibility just keeps getting better and better the higher that stuff gets. If nothing else, if she's out there, at least this is like a huge morale deal. Will to survive on sunlight, sunlight, and helicopters. There's one set of tracks that goes off to the left into the woods, but I don't know why she would do that. It's on the bank. Well, let's find her and ask her. Uh, you know, that trail in the woods is right down there. It's 3 o'clock right now. We searched for a long time. We searched in the same places six to ten times over. That's what it's like, though. That's just a reflection off a puddle. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully we can find this person. It's really pissing me off that we can't find a four-wheeler, you know? Like, I feel like that means we're just not looking in the right spot. At this time, we were getting close to our bag-out time as a crew. I believe the pilots had close to eight hours on them, and that's the point where you have to cut off, regardless if you want to go or not. I wanted to search the road real well. I wanted to search the river real well, and we did that. If she's out here and alive, I guarantee you we've flown over her. Yeah, I feel like we've covered every area. Well, I think my brain is spent from searching. I'm gonna head back. Yep. The time goes on and it gets harder and harder to stay focused, to really execute what we want to as planned and as we've been trained. So we finish up our last hour of searching. We know we're tired. We know we're not as effective as we were without seven and a half hours of flight time on us. We need relief. I feel like we really scraped a lot of that base. That was before we got tired, too. Yeah. <laughs> it was still nighttime. No, I was tired. The other plane's gonna take off as we're landing, and I am certain that they're gonna find this person. It's getting sunnier, the search conditions are getting better, it's warming up, and the Alaska State Troopers are out there in force. Pretty much on scene, guys. It's slowing down a little bit, coming down. Roger. All right, guys, so uh, just a pass down from the, uh, the previous crew there. The troopers are out there, kind of working the riverbeds there. But the, uh, the gal was wearing a black sweatshirt, blue jeans, and it's a green ATV. I got woken up around 5 o'clock. There had been a crew flying all night. Uh, they needed a replacement to continue on the search. Searches are always tough, but at least we can see down into it. It's gorgeous. I saw a bear over there, so that's not good. 
Well, this is May 2nd, but if you're gonna get lost, this kind of seems like the place that you would get lost at because it's a nice open flat area. Yeah. You could easily get on the wrong track. There are fresh tracks directly below us. Yeah. Here they are. We're uh, headed back towards the river. Yep, I was gonna put that out the right side and just kind of go along that way. Because it's overland, it's gonna be a little bit different in how we approach the search. We're not using an actual search pattern. We're kind of picking out our own technique of how we want to cover the ground. Coast Guard helicopter. We have multiple four-wheeler tracks going to and from the hillside. Which is which? The Alaska State Troopers had actually found fresh tracks from the ATV. Noticed that they had gotten stuck several times. So we got down and tried to follow those tracks. There's like four-wheeler tracks going to the left and to the right. So they should be right over here, then. There's no place around here. Well, this morning, we received a call that there was a missing four-wheeler down at Saltry Pass. Right there at 3 o'clock, there's something. All right, let's follow this, uh, follow this blue back. A little, a little bit, sir. I am pretty sure I saw a quad. All right. All right, so keep rolling, sir, keep rolling. Almost underneath us. Right there. There's the quad. There's the quad. Nice spot. Was the four-wheeler upright? Uh, it oh, looked like it was upright. She just went straight into the water. Probably sunk. We searched for two hours and I spotted the quad first. And then we kind of tracked from the quad, kind of following footsteps, kind of going in the direction where we think maybe she went, just out of common sense. So she could have gone anywhere from this point. Yeah. I would think that she would follow the river down. So let's follow that point, let's follow that river. We did multiple searches at that point. The footsteps seemed to be following uh, the river downstream. We kind of honed in our search up and down the river. And then at that point, we had tried a parallel search, just a different search, just to maybe see if she was in a completely different area. The question is, you know, when did she get stuck there? When did she start walking? Yeah, I don't know. I would like to think she would follow the stream all the way out. It sounds like she would go to higher ground, because I wouldn't want to be wet. You know that being wet equals death, right? Once we found the ATV, it's kind of a small victory. We've at least found something, and uh, kind of motivates us again to keep uh, keep the search going. Any search, if you find the vehicle, you're hoping the survivor's going to be close by. Where would I go if I was lost? Yeah, exactly. See this boat off the right? I do. Are there human footprints, or those are all human prints? I can't really tell, sir. I'd come down a little bit. Sir, off to our left, I see somebody waving their arms about probably a mile. Right at our 12 o'clock now. Way out there? Yeah, way out yep. there. There you are, there you are. Yeah. Got her. Somebody's jumping. It was like a breath of fresh air. Seeing her from the helicopter, when you find her, the assessment there that she's pretty OK. Yeah, that's her. I'm going to put her down on the spot over here. We were able to land, and the flight mech and I Got out, went up to her. I told her it was gonna be okay. She was really scared. She was wet, I assume from probably walking through the rivers, which she shouldn't have done, but she did. And she was crying. When we got her into the helo, we sat her in the troop seat and gave her blankets, got her buckled up, comfortable, and we flew back to Kodiak. She was definitely soaked, and she was shivering. She was pretty cold. She was laughing and crying at the same time. I think she was pretty happy to see us, and she was pretty happy to get out of there. It's a very short transit back to the air station. Four landing checklist abbreviated. Yeah. Uh, it feels pretty good when a survivor is able to talk to you and just, you know, able to say thank you. I'm just glad that uh, that she was that she was okay. How are you doing, man? Tired. Yeah. On the cold side, are you? Yeah. Okay, but that's all right. We're gonna have the ambulance yeah, right. and we'll be here in a few minutes. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get you in there, okay? <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I am so glad to be 
got it. Yeah, we're so glad you're here. Yeah, thank these guys over here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, medics are here. Yeah, I can feel how cold you are. Yeah. Her words are closure for me, just saying basically thank you. You know, that's what she said, thank you. So it kind of just seals in the rescue. Expecting to hoist one male basket hoist. Bring him back here. Six-year-old male Philippine citizen. The initial report we got was that a individual had fallen 10 feet on the um, motor vessel Sealand Charger. Uh, he had injuries to his shoulder and his face. Depending on how clear the location is, toss the idea in my own head about putting you down. You need someone down here. It's approximately 112 miles offshore. The survivor was ambulatory, so we knew we were going to essentially be doing a basket hoist. Any questions, concerns about that? Nope. Sounds good. All right. Ready up. Ready forward. Ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. We took off. It's about a 45-minute transit for us. We had a C-130 covering us because we were beyond the 100-mile mark from Air Station Kodiak. They would be on scene about 30 minutes before us, so they were able to do some briefings with the crew of the ship prior to our arrival. Anything other than the basket? No, not right at this time. The time was right. The time was right, yeah. Yeah, what a beautiful morning. We were able to take off just before sunrise. We had uh, just enough light. We didn't need to use night vision goggles. The C-130, with their speed, they were able to get there. They were able to scope out the vessel and identify potential hoisting locations for us. Kodiak, this is Rescue 07. Go ahead, over. We could hear the conversations basically one-sided from our C-130 overhead, but we couldn't hear the crew's responses. Nate, you copy that last one on radio, too? Yeah. You'll have two containers wide, which is plenty of room. Yeah. I think you're going to see the ship on the horizon there. a little dot right there, bro. Yeah. Hoisting from these large container ships is kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes uh, they have a very nice area for you to hoist from. Sometimes they are so covered in equipment and, and goods that it's actually hard to find an area to hoist. Did you see where the spot was that they were talking about? Yeah, we're thinking. You know, the very aft, the okay. very last row, oh, the okay. very back of the boat. I'm assuming it's that very corner right there. See those giant yellow high voltage sticker? I think that's where he's talking about. Once we get on scene, we circle the vessel a few times, try to check out the hoisting area that they designated for us. What do you guys think? Easy enough? Yeah, that's good right there. We all agreed upon that hoisting area, and we decided at that time not to put it on the swimmer because the uh, survivor was ambulatory. Looks like our member is uh, sitting down there on the container. So let's try get on. I can just slide the right a little bit and we'll be ready to always. I'm probably doing some trail line at least, hey, Mr. Lewis, just uh, so he yeah. uh, stays away from the other Correct. containers. Correct. Our only potential concern was having the basket hit one of the containers as it came up. It had to pass three stacked containers on his way up. We wanted to make sure we didn't injure him more uh, trying to recover him into the helicopter. Rest is absolutely ready for one basket deployment with uh, trail line to uh, the designated area. Okay, target's at 2 o'clock. You can meet the point. Roger that. Target side, trail line's on top of the door. Easy right, hold. Pay out trail line. We elected to do a trail line delivery of the basket. We lowered essentially a 105-foot rope down to the ship. And then when that rope hit the deck, the crew took possession of it. Passed outside the cabin door. Passed going down. Passed going down. Back on deck, right next to the patient. Patient's going inside the basket. Patient just inside the basket, waiting for ready for pickup. All right, ready for pickup, easy right. Prepare to explode. Patient just inside the basket, waiting for ready for pickup. All right, ready for pickup, easy right. Prepare to explode. The initial report we got was that a uh, individual had fallen 10 feet on the um, motor vessel Sealand Charger. Uh, he had injuries to his shoulder and his face. Check out load. Patient's coming up. Using the basket, he came up. We had one container stacked higher in front of us, which was probably within about 30 feet of the aircraft. Patient's clear of the bottom two containers. 
And patient clear to call the container. Traffic. Patient outside the cabin door. Bring him inside. It's a very quick evolution. By not having to put our swimmer on the vessel, we are able to arrive on scene, hoist the survivor, and be out of there within 10 minutes. Let's have a door, ready for flight. I'm gonna put a little O2 on him. Okay. Yeah, he's pretty banked up. We got the survivor set up on the troop seat, put some oxygen on him, asked him a couple questions. And you said your neck hurts on the left side. Does your left shoulder hurt at all? Just the right one? Okay. The crew had two EMTs on board, and they had patched him up pretty good. All right, yeah, just stay as still as you can. We're going to put you in an ambulance and get you all taken care of, all right? 20 minutes out, guys. Oh, right, they're flying form with us. Picture-worthy moment. C-130 with the sunrise behind it. Transit back. C-130 was in our trail the entire time, and they were able to relay communications with home plate and ensure that awaiting medical services were at the ramp for us. All right, we're going to be uh, landing here in a couple minutes, OK? Coming down. We train all the time here to prepare for the worst case scenario, the worst weather, the worst on-scene conditions. It was nice to have a nice, easy one today. My name is Mario Baja. We were on our way from Oakland to Yokohama, Japan. I was ordered to secure a rigging. I lost my left footings. And then after that, follows my right. The right side of my face hit hard on these steel structures. I was soaked in blood my whole face. I have multiple fractures. When the captain told me that the Coast Guard helicopter will be here in 20 minutes, I said, well, thank you, God, thank you. I was really happy that I can get to a hospital like the doctor will be taking care of me. According to the doctor, my facial bones are back in place, so that really makes me happy, too. Really, really, I appreciate the U.S. Coast Guard on Kodiak Island. Thank you very much for helping me. Make sure you get all your lunches. Thinking, okay? David. We're here at Dog Bay Boat Ramp. We're getting ready to go out fishing with the Wounded Warriors program. Chuck Bell, the engineering officer here at the air station, is going to take us out. Then we're going to do a little bit of fishing for halibut. The Wounded Warrior Project is a veteran advocacy group working to empower and honor the service that men and women uh, of this country and all of our armed forces have, uh, have given to us and giving back to them um, through various programs and services. Today we have our annual Kodiak fishing trip. Truly all the Coast Guardsmen here in Kodiak have been very, very welcoming. Both myself and another service member will be on the boat with them and get guided around and hopefully uh, bring in a lot of big fish. We're in 190 feet of water, hoping to catch some halibut. Get on it. There, there he is. You got one. Get him, Kirk. Go in after it, Kirk. Right, nice and easy. Nice and easy. Man, that's oh, a big one, man. A nice size. Yeah, good work. He was heavy. Being out here on the boat with fellow wounded warriors as well as the Coast Guard staff has been amazing. He's a nice sized fish, too. I mean, yeah. Oh, that's good eating right there. Got a boy! The Wounded Warrior Project is a program that defines brotherhood, sisterhood, togetherness to kind of help take our minds off of the struggles that we experience during combat activities. We're doing well now. <laughs> we're all having a great time. We're all either have been in the service or are in the service now, so we're able to sit back and swap stories while we're waiting on the fish, and it really just goes right back to just how welcoming these guys were and intrigued to our stories just as much as we were intrigued to theirs. In Afghanistan, we always ran into problem with when we needed air. It was, you know, pilots said, you know, we're all bagged, or they've been flying for so many yeah. hours that they just, they weren't allowed to come out. I didn't know if it was the same for the Coast Guards as the Army, the Navy, and all that. If you're airborne six hours, when you touch down your ground, you're bagged. Yep. You know, all those rules are written in blood and bent metal. Yeah, right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's 345. I think we need to head back. 
to be able to work with the Wounded Warriors Project is a real boon for us. Anytime we can help out another uh, person in uniform makes us feel good. It's a good way to relax for both us and them. We had a great time fishing and a great time bonding. Operations Attendant Bootcheck. So we just received a call from Dish 17 requesting a medevac of an 81 year old female down in Akiok. It's about 75 miles to the uh, southwest of us. All we know is she has heart pain, labor breathing, and that it's a cardiac incident over. Deadline will be four hours to get her to a higher level of care. The worst case scenario would be some kind of cardiac event in the helicopter on the way back. native village of Akiak. It's a very small community, probably less than 100 people there. They don't have advanced medical care. Come right in, taxi. Right in, taxi. Do you have any concerns? Uh, my normal concern is heart attack, especially somebody that old. There's an individual with chest pains, and usually the first thing I think about is heart attack. Come right in, take off. Ready for take off. All right, coming up. Ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. All right, coming up. The alarm went off at about midnight. Got up pretty quick. Got over to the hangar pretty, pretty fast. And that's when I found out it was a medevac. Individual with chest pains, and usually the first thing I think about is heart attack. Sector zero three. Do you have any amplifying information for this case? Through sector anchorage. Stand by. In route, we were trying to get more information about the patient, if she was doing better, if she was doing worse. It turned out she was actually getting a little bit worse. I do have the pro pack, so basically tell me heart rate, blood pressure, um, and then the AD, if she does have a heart attack while we're in route. What's our ETA, sir, about 15 minutes? Yep. As we approached the native village of Akiak, it looked like there was vehicles there with their headlights illuminating the landing zone. Report, report. Report, report. So we made the approach. We came in onto a snow-covered runway. Break the set. Roger. Sir, I'm going to go out and check her out, and then I'll uh, call when I'm coming back in. OK. Roger. Roger. Once we got on scene, they brought her out. She was already packaged up in a litter. You want to grab the head? Yeah. It was a little bit tricky carrying the litter. The gravel had a little bit of ice on it, so we just had to go slow and make sure that first we didn't slip on the ice, and then second, we also didn't drop the patient. All right, you guys doing good back there? Good, sir. She's pretty wrapped up. Oh, yeah, look at that cute blanket. All right, group ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. Cool. Here we go. Ready to go. Hey, taking blood pressure. About 35 over 66. A little lower than you're hoping for, huh? Yeah. We got her some oxygen. I just monitored her vital signs, her heart rate and her blood pressure. She has a weak heart rate, down to 58 beats per minute. Is she weak and responsive? She is, but she's a little slow. My main concern is a heart attack. I did feel a heart rate, but it was a very slow beat. That's when you know it's really starting to get dangerous. Balance pressure is getting lower. It's at 46 now. It's uh, just gotten weaker and weaker. Her vital signs were changing, fluctuating a little bit, uh, indicating she may have been exhibiting some type of uh, shock symptoms. Blood pressure, 133 went down. I can see that she's in pain. Her face is wincing pretty good. It was good we were getting her out of there then and not waiting. She could go downhill pretty fast. Uh, coming into the ramp and coming down. So you got the ambulance there at the fuel house. When we land in Kodiak, we always have the paramedics waiting. That way it goes from an EMT to a paramedic, higher level of care, then give her IVs, stuff like that, things I can't do in the aircraft. I got her into the ambulance. I passed off all my information, blood pressures, her heart rate, a few more questions and answers, me and the paramedics, and they were on their way to the hospital. Anything we could have done better? It all went good. A lot of Alaska is remote. We do have a lot of native villages and small communities. And it's an honor to be able to serve them as a Coast Guard aviator. Well, 
Onida Phillips, born here in Akyak. I'm 81 or 82. I don't remember. <laughs> there was something wrong with my heart. And my heart almost stopped, maybe. I remember they said they were going to call the Coast Guard. It was very nice. He took care of me all the way. Did their best to do everything for me. Bring me over to Providence Hospital. So I'm doing really good now. Coast Guard is a lifesaver. I thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I've had the honor and privilege to lead the men and women of the 17th Coast Guard District for three years. Rear Admiral Tom Ostabo, 17th District Commander for the Coast Guard in Juneau, Alaska. This tour has been the most rewarding tour of my career. What we do up here on a day-to-day -day basis is exceptional anywhere else on the earth. The Coast Guard men and women of District 17 have saved literally thousands of lives. From Dutch Harbor to Nome to Ketchikan, 44,000 miles of coastland, 4 million miles of water, SAR cases, hundreds of miles offshore, and the harshest weather that this planet offers. My name is Vice Admiral Charlie Ray. I'm the Pacific Area Commander, which means I'm responsible for Coast Guard operations. From Alaska to American Samoa, what happens here in Alaska, in this terrain, in this great state, matters not just to the people of Alaska, but it matters to the nation. This is the big leagues up here in Alaska. Now, there's no end to the good that the Coast Guard can do in Alaska, and we're up to it. May God bless you all. May God bless the United States Coast Guard. May God bless America. Simple price. <laughs> 